Um, hello, everyone. This is the first event of the Theory Center, the Centrum für Theory and Indian History and Forschung, this semester. And our guest is uh, Joni Marti Kupanen from the University of Oulu, where he uh, runs the Center for Philosophical Studies uh, of uh, History. And uh, <coughs> He is also the acting editor of the Journal of the Philosophy of History, which just took over from Frank Ankerschmidt. And uh, yes, Jon Mati has a background in the philosophy of science. Uh, and he's going to talk about something else than it was advertised. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> thank you, Charlton. Thank you. Thanks for this uh, introduction. Uh, I'm very, very happy, very pleased to be here in your center. And the disappointment is there now. It's the title is different, so it's time to leave whoever wants. <laughs> but I will proceed with this historical knowledge as uh, knowledge how. Uh, this is a um, entirely fresh stuff. I have finished the first draft that I'm presenting here uh, two weeks ago. And this is an attempt to uh, push some things further that I started developing in my uh, book, post narratives Philosophy of Historiography. And, and, and we'll see, I'm very interested in your feedback. Uh, so I will be uh, talking about uh, knowledge, as you all can see. A uh, very traditional topic in, in epistemology, of course. But I'm, I'm trying to take this whole approach to closer to pragmatism and asked uh, knowledge, the starting point is historiography, it's a knowledge producing activity, but knowledge in what sense? That's, that's my, my question uh, pretty much today. And then really connecting it closer to pragmatism and then via pragmatism to historiography, what knowledge would be in historiography. Um, so I will have a text and I have the slides and I will be going between those two. Uh, the, uh, the content just displayed uh, there. So my main message is a, there would be a need for a paradigm shift of how historical knowledge is understood. And already now apologies for this hyperbolic statement. But nevertheless, I feel that in the way that I'm trying to formulate today, in the pragmatist way, uh, it hasn't been presented before, so I, I hope there is some fresh uh, inside fresh things to say. Uh, I will first talk about uh, non-representationism, uh, anti-representation difference between them. That's an issue that I took up in the, in the book already. And a central idea is that representationism, as will be defined now, entails a knowledge that, uh, and then there is a problem, which I have termed as entailing a missing representation is counterpart, so there are no uh, objects that would make those interpretations true. And I will ground and then uh, tell why. Uh, we go further and then uh, I will rely on Gilbert Ryle here. I found his uh, philosophy now fresh and I found it useful and obviously knowing how is uh, something that he initially uh, formulated in the 1940s. And then, in the end, I'm trying to <coughs> sum up everything together and say uh, what, knowing how, how it would look like in historiography. Okay, so uh, some of you might have seen, uh, or even some few might have read the book Post-Narrativist Philosophy of Historiography, and in, uh, in that book, I labeled my position as a non-representationalist. So the idea is roughly that we should not think that we form representations of an object that is given prior to any constructive act in our language or other modes of presentation. Now, I think a uh, good question is why, anti, why non and why not anti-representationalism? And uh, the reason is simply that the <coughs> Anti-representation is a more demanding position as in, in Rawley's philosophy, Richard Rawley's philosophy, for example. It's a larger philosophical program covering the language-world relationship in its entirety. 
uh, saying roughly that language can never represent entities and properties in the world. And I didn't have courage enough to go so far. Uh, I was a bit cowardice and, and hesitated to take this strong position, especially provided that there is a fairly successful, very successful indeed, orientation of philosophy, which doesn't seem to have any problems in, uh, with representationism, and I'm talking about analytic philosophy of language. Uh, so there is a, a problem already here that he, when we talk about representations and actually representationalism here, uh, it's used in more than uh, one sense. And I'm not trying to be comprehensive, but just displaying two senses here that I found useful. Uh, so the first one is, is uh, philosophy of language and semantics. Uh, in analytic philosophy, where referential relations to the external world are fixed. Frank Angersmith uh, uses it in quite a different sense. It means something, some kind of holistic being about, function like in pictures, in which composite parts cannot be detached from each other, uh, in his uh, understanding. And then I think it's probably fair to say that Rorty, the third one, in Rorty's philosophy representationism, is, uh, signifies a certain ideology that has bewitched Western philosophy ever since the 17th century. Okay, there are more than one sentence to a little bit exemplify this, uh, how this seemed to function in um, philosophy of language. This is <coughs> Michael Derrit, a famous philosopher of language, talking. He writes, uh, the core of a linguistic symbol's meaning lies in the fact that the symbol represents something. For example, the core of the meaning of Reagan lies in the fact that it represents a well-known former president of the United States. In other words, in analytic philosophy, um, representation means the reflection of the state of affairs uh, in the external world. And forming representation is typically an attempt to determine referential relations of composite expressions of a sentence. So, to exemplify, the idea is that if you have a proposition, Sam is sad, uh, it represents the state of affairs, that Sam is indeed sad, and is true only if this state of affairs obtains. Uh, that's the kind of thinking in analytic philosophy of history. And uh, we could take up here Robert Brandom, who is not a representationist, who is inferentialist. He has stated, I think aptly, that the master concept of enlightenment uh, in semantics and epistemology, at least in Segard, was representation. And in, in general, I think Brandom goes along the same line as uh, Rorty here. He also seeks another kind of framework to express these uh, word language relations. Uh, so then, taking a bit closer look at Rorty, so Rorty's metaphors, glassy essence and the mirror of nature, both refer to the same idea of the mind as a great mirror, which contains several representations, some of which are, as he says, accurate, some of which are uh, not ac less accurate and some not accurate at all about the external world. And then he writes, uh, without the notion of the mind as mirror, the notion of knowledge as accuracy of representation would not have suggested itself. Uh, now, it's worth repeating the last part. The notion of knowledge as accuracy of representation. And I keep coming to this uh, idea several times in this talk. Uh, perhaps we might express that in um, representationism you are forced to play in this kind of game of uh, matching and mirroring between world and language. And uh, the mirror of nature metaphor is in an essence an expression of some kind of uh, representationist realism, according to which we should form the exact copies of objects in the world, like good mirrors and cameras are said to do. If this is achieved, the term representation is most fitting because the theory, description, a mind, then presents the object in as faithful a form as possible. So it, uh, as if, presents it 
again, again in another form, in another mode. And in any case, a faithful copying sets the standard of for evaluating how successful <coughs> representations are. So as uh, Rodi, quoting again, has said, the notion of an unclouded mirror of nature is the notion of a mirror which could be indistinguishable from what was mirrored, and thus would not be a mirror at all, in a sense, if it's so successful in, in the copying function. Okay, my talk is not meant to be a commentary on, on Rorty in any specific way, uh, but I have found uh, his book useful, and since I was already talking about representation, representationism, I thought of lights to go back to Rorty's 1980 book, Philosophy and the Mirror of Nature. And two points are worth making before moving on. And uh, those are, in my view, Rorty analyzes excellently this underlying representationalist ideology that, as he says, has uh, so widely spread, uh, so widely spread that it's sometimes difficult to think without it, without representationalist language. And the other comment is uh, that Rorty links his uh, rejection of representationalism to a rejection of epistemology. So it's clear that he has a very speci special, specific idea of epistemology in his mind. It's not the kind of epistemology practiced in contemporary epistemology. So Rodi's idea, or oh, it's a form, but it's not all of it. Rodi's idea is that epistemology is committed to what was said about, uh, that knowledge is the same as accuracy of representation. representation. So one consequence of this framing is that epistemology may survive very well even if representationalism is rejected. So in representationalism is the success of mirroring the given in the world, in our thinking, in our language, that provides the standard of knowledge, as uh, said before. And the really crunch point is that if some other standard of knowledge is found, then epistemology may, may uh, of course, survive from this assault. And indeed, this is the topic today, how to survive epistemology, uh, how to save epistemology, and how to talk about knowledge without uh, representation, as I have defined now, right here. Uh, so, while in post-narrativist philosophy of historiography, I limited my non-representationism to historiography, uh, Brian Fay, in his very uh, charitable review of the book, urges me to go further, I just need to go all the way to pragmatism from my already leaning, uh, uh, substantial leanings towards it. And this is what I attempt to do today in a very specific sense. So I take a lead from uh, Rotian representationalism as an ideology to be rejected. And then I lean on two philosophers. Uh, one is Gilbert Ryle and the other is Robert Brandom. Uh, for Brandom uh, still assumes a minor part here. But I intend to keep on working on it also in the future, more deeply. So, um, coming to the second part now. Representationalism as entailing knowledge that. So I would like to spell out something that appears to be entailed by representationalism as used, for example, by Rorty. And that is that. Representationalism entails knowledge that. The, this phrase is familiar to, to many of who have taken introduction class in epistemology, uh, and the two other forms of knowledge, other types are knowledge how and, and knowledge by uh, acquaintance. And the, the main sticking point is today is the distinction between knowledge that and, and knowledge how. And my argument will be that historical knowledge or knowledge in historiography should be understood as knowing how. Uh, and the problem is that typically it's understood as knowledge that, which takes us to, in my way, to all kinds of bogus re-representations and to the problems of matching, to the problems of getting it right about the external world, to the problem of, of representations. A slight intermission here. So uh, now if someone objects and says that the, it's not necessary to accept the resemblance or copy theory of uh, representationalism, as I have suggested, and instead we could uh, think representation as a, some kind of standing for function. So that is to represent is one of to represent is one object to stand for another, and not necessarily to copy it. 
Okay, but then I'm not at all sure that it would be correct to say that a text of history stands for the past. In my understanding, a text and actual things that happened perhaps quite a long time ago are totally different kinds of things, so it does not make good sense to suggest that one of them stands for the other. To me, it looks like the function of texts are uh, something rather different. And now I return back to the uh, main issue, which is um, knowledge, knowing how. And so that's uh, Gilbert Drive, uh, smoking pipe. And uh, so the, it was him, Ryle, who introduced his, in his presidential address entitled Knowing How, and knowing that this very distinction uh, in for the, to the Aristotelian Society in 1945, and then uh, developed in this modern classic in the Concept of Mind 1949. Okay, what are these two types of knowledge? So, uh, I'm not trying to bore you if you are familiar with this, but I think it's necessary to say something to define them in what kinds of knowledge, types of knowledge we are actually talking about. So, first, knowing that. So, knowing that is a... Um, so-called propositional knowledge, and takes commonly the form of uh, declarative statements like Jones, Jones knows that, followed by a proposition that is known, which can be, for example, that London is the capital of the United Kingdom, that it's raining, that 2 plus 2 is 4, etc., etc. Now, I think it seems natural to say that that which is known must be true, Something, if it's known, it can be false. When a proposition known is true, it's typically said to be a fact. In other words, a fact is the same as true proposition. And I'm here following, actually, a declaration that stems from Frege, who famously claimed that fact is a thought that is true. So, the truth of a proposition of its facticity consists in its correct reflection of or, of, or, or the correspondence of the state of affairs in the external world. In other words, uh, its composite parts refer to entities and predicates in the world, and uh, they postulate correct relationship about them. So perhaps an archetypical example would be a knowledge clause and the following proposition. I know that Frank is taller than Paul, if this is known. The proposition that Frank is taller than Paul is true, or if it's a fact that Frank is taller than Paul, it then tells that both Frank and Paul refer to real persons and that this proposition postulates a correct relationship about them, namely, that the man known as Frank is indeed taller than the man known as Paul. Okay, another intermission. Uh, if someone is now disturbed by Phrygian use of facts here, it's worth noting that there is naturally another widely spread understanding of facts, uh, which may uh, be very common indeed. So facts are often understood as uh, something like as the furniture of the world, as the states of affairs themselves, which make propositions true and not as true propositions, so truth makers. Facts then play the role of what makes judgments correct and propositions true. And I will make clear in what follows in which sense I'm talking about facts. And also that I don't make any commitment myself to facts, but it's just necessary to talk about them in order to make clear what's the issue, what's at stake in uh, representationalism. Okay, now, again, getting back to and some uh, conclusions, drawing some conclusions. So I think we are ready to sum up a sort of paradigm case of knowledge that, and by that token, a paradigmatic case of knowing in the representational sense. And that's that the standard of knowledge is that we manage to get accurate description, representation in our language of the external state of affairs. And therefore, the conclusion of this action is this. Representationalism entails knowledge. That, to know, is to mirror and structure the external world in our language the best we can. And I will analyze uh, uh, knowledge, uh, knowing how, later in this talk. So what would be the, the problem here? And that I'm trying to... Uh, outline in this third section the missing uh, representation of counterpart. And the main claim of this section is knowledge that does not capture the correct relationship between the mode of presentation 
and the object world in historiography. Obviously, note that I'm using uh, here representationalist language. My aim is to go beyond it, beyond the representationalist language, but sometimes it's just easier to stick to the older, more familiar type of expressions. So in other words, the claim is the following. There is no object or structure or a complex fact, if you like, which would be represented and true of a historiographical account. And this is the reason why knowledge that account does not apply, doesn't work. So there would be nothing to make these uh, higher order accounts, historiographical accounts true. Theses of books of history are thus not true or false in the representational sense. They are not facts in the Freudian sense or there is no fact of the matter for higher order knowledge in historiography. Or to put yet alternatively, the standard of the epistemic standing should not be the accuracy of representation of the object world. And the crucial thing is that, nevertheless, still, I wish to talk about knowledge, but in a different sense than in the representation sense that I've been trying to outline up to this point. Um, so... The claim that there is no representational object is naturally premised on something, and it's premised on an assumption that historiographical knowledge refers to the synthesized cognitive contributions of writing. They are often called narratives, sometimes narrative substances, sometimes theses, sometimes in representations, sometimes interpretations, and so on and so forth. That a book of history in its total and its text in total produces. And not, for example, the main knowledge contribution is not, for example, singular statements or fragments of text. And these are what I have called uh, the narrativist insight, and this is what I have also endorsed in my thinking. Now I mention one example of these problems in finding a representationist counterpart, the problem, the case that I have used earlier, and studied in some detail here. So this is a Christopher Clark's claim that the great powers of Europe went to the first war like sleepwalkers. In his book, The Sleepwalkers, How Europe Went to War in 1914. And if and when we are being the matter from the representationalist perspective, a natural starting point is that truth requires referentiality. So in the representationalist paradigm, a claim like this about uh, sleepwalking it's like a model of the world represented. It is assumed that nouns and proper names refer and predicates and verbs ascribe correct properties, actions, processes to this in the external world. Okay, to begin with, it does not seem too difficult to identify great powers of Europe. There were Germany, Austro-Hungary, Russia, France, the United Kingdom. But note that this is already a class, uh, this is not an object, this is a class of objects. Now, it would be much more problematic to attribute the process of sleepwalking to these great powers of Europe. So I take it that no one would suggest that they literally sleepwalk like a person may stand up while sleeping and walk without waking up. Uh, this is a metaphor, but I think it's a good metaphor. It's a good, good claim to make. And it gives a specific sense uh, to this process. All comes down to how we analyze of what is indeed claimed. To put it in other words, the issue is reduced to the analysis of the logical structure of this claim. And now we may ask what would be a sensible analysis of what is claimed. And I'm not trying to imagine all possible analysis, as I'm in the opinion that the burden of proof is on the shoulders of the defenders of representationalism in history. However, one plausible interpretation uh, is to reduce this type of, for example, metaphoric expressions like sleepwalking to some directly referential statements and explain away in this sense. So let's call this attempt the shorthand view. So we would translate the sleepwalking claim to a set of other subordinate claims, like these are the claims that uh, Clark, among so many others, claims in his book that the Kaiser Wilhelm was indecisive ruler, austro hungarian decision structures were like a beehive and they never managed to systematically weigh decisions. The population of Europe believed that the next war would be a short and sharp cabinet war, nothing to be afraid of. British forensic 
Gray did not want an anticipate war still in July 1914. Great powers did not trust each other, and we could go on and we could go on and go on. Uh, we would need to add more specific claims, decisions and steps taken, which led to the end results that no one was able to foresee, according to Clark, and that's where they sleepwalk to it. In the end, amounted to a development that led to a disaster, the Great War. Okay, I hope we realize now that it's not only the noun great powers that refers to a class, also the claim about their sleepwalking refers to a whole set or a class of statesmen describing the state of the world at the time. And know that it might not be possible to make these sentences, these subordinated sentences, either directly referential, as in the case with Beehive, for example. It's a uh, beehive structure of the Austro-Hungary. Uh, it's uh, bureaucracies. It's a metaphor. And there are other metaphors about uh, that sleepwalking thesis in Thais. Now, the most important thing here is that even if all these subordinated claims were referential and were true, they would not entail sleepwalking. Sleepwalking, that's why I called it higher order knowledge. And if that's accepted as the main knowledge contribution, what uh, Clark puts forward. So, sleepwalking thesis is an interpretation of the whole process or of what characterizes and unites all subordinated states and processes. Further, neither is it that they all have a property of sleepwalking. Uh, Branko Mitrovic suggested uh, that the expression of this kind, sleepwalking, can be explained by the said property, or he didn't claim exactly this but I have another example. Uh, well, in the case of property of sleepwalking in Clark and the property of liberalism, or something similar underlying the use of uh, Khrushchev's Thor in the history of uh, Soviet Union, which is used to lump together a diverse set of alleged manifestations of this spirit. So that's all kinds of starting from the release of prisoners from Gulag and, and Khrushchev visiting the, uh, going to Yugoslavia and relaxation of censorship and all kinds of things and they are under the top. Um, but if there is such a property, if it is claimed that there is such a property that unites all these various uh, elements, it's like talking an 18th century chemist in Moliere's play who says that opium produces sleep because it contains a dormitive power. So that is, it explains nothing about the function of opium or in our case colligatory notions but merely repeats the first part of the expression in the second with different words. So relation is rather the following. All subordinate claims contribute to the understanding of what happened as part of this colligated whole. This whole is something new and emergent from lower scale states of affairs. So uh, now what in thought of what to make out of this observation that the sleepwalking thesis cannot be made referential and true and further that even when reduced to a set of subordinated claims that I displayed earlier, uh, its truth, sleepwalking thesis truth, cannot be inferred from the truth of these subordinated claims. And I would have had another example about uh, Eric Hobsbawm's uh, claim that the 20th century was short in his book, The Age of Extremes, the short 20th century, 1940-1991. But uh, in my way, it would be uh, challenging, to say the least, to make this representation of somehow. Uh, arguably, centuries are 100 years, and not shorter than that, if you take it literally. But what to conclude? Uh, I have taken some approaches, and you, I'm sure you'll come up with some others. So the postmodernist post approach would be to say that interpretations like sleepwalking, <coughs> lack any kind of cognitive justification. They are totally subjective significations onto something objective, like facts in the substan substantive metaphysical sense. So postponents still like to talk about facts, which is interesting. Uh, in their mind, this process would thus seem to be devoid of any logical, any epistemic justification. Uh, Potential another approach is Anke Smithian, and that is to detach of what is represented from the object world and make it somehow text-dependent, uh, as he may be said to have done. In his theory, 
a representation of a historian's text refers to what he calls aspect of presented, which is like a point of view to the object as postulated in that textual representation. So, for example, a book about Napoleon uh, may represent Napoleon as an arrogant ruler, and this is the aspect of presented of the book, and this is what is represented. Not the Napoleon is represented, but this aspect of presented. That's Uncle Smithian theory. Okay, both of these uh, approaches have some merit, and both they are, I would say, logical reactions to some problems of trying to match or mirror uh, the representation of historiography with the object uh, world of the past. However, they both also presuppose representationalism and are reactions to a naive view of it. The difference is that postmodernist view is negative and Angus Mithian is positive, perhaps. In the first case, any scope for epistemic justification is given up, and in the other, perhaps not. But the theory of represented is developed further, and the naive account is replaced by a detailed analysis of what presentations, aspects, representations, represented are ontologically and epistemologically, and specifically in what relation they would stand to the object world. My worry regarding Anke Smith is uh, that it leads to more difficult problems and questions, uh, for example, about the ontological status and pragmatic value of his aspects. So, more difficult problems than it was designed to solve initially. Uh, it's still worth studying, it's a sophisticated attempt. But if I needed to express the uh, problem to acquire accurate descriptions of the state of affairs in historiography, the problem would be the following. There are no complex facts or structured state of affairs which would re be required to make the thesis like the sleepwalking one true, even if there were simple atomic facts that these are composed of. The world, not even the past world, comes as ready structured or given. This would be my analysis. And I have no doubt that this could be developed further, this representationism, we could try to solve the problems, alleviate the issues. My message is today there's another way to go, and the rest of the talk is trying to outline it. And the key would be to reject representationism, not try to survive with the problems, not to find solutions, but to reject the framework itself, which would liberate us from the problems of representation and matching, in other words, let's stop looking for a representation or model in historiography that would be true of the world, represented or modeled. Uh, another way is to understand knowledge and justification. Uh, there is another way to understand knowledge and justification in historiography. And the change of this framework would enable to bypass the difficult problems that uh, representationism is marked with. So this is the right and knowing how, moving from the concept of knowing that as I claim that representations would entail to another concept of knowledge, and that would be a knowing how. Uh, there's a picture of uh, one way to know how to do something, know how to ride bikes, so that's a sort of knowledge already. So the key tenet of knowing how is that knowing is knowing how to do something, in other words, when one knows uh, something, one has acquired a skill, a certain skill or a capacity to perform a specific action. Okay, we might want to ask, when does one know how to play chess, for example? Knowing and being able to cite the rules of the game is not enough, but the player must be able to move pieces appropriately. He knows how to play when, uh, in while, it has become second nature to him to do what is allowed and to avoid what is forbidden. It may even happen that the player forgets the rules or at least an ability to state the rules to a beginner and still be able to play chess perfectly well. Again, Ryle says, he is said to know play if, although he cannot cite the rules, he normally does make the permitted moves, avoid the forbidden moves and protests if his opponent makes forbidden moves. His knowledge how is exercised primarily in the moves that he makes or concedes and in the moves that he avoids or vetoes. 
Uh, that's from the concept of mind. Ryle talked about uh, intellectualism and anti-intellectualism. Uh, the intellectualism is the position according to which all knowledge is ultimately reduced to knowledge that of propositional knowledge, as we already talked about. Intellectualism assumes further that knowledge how is dependent on knowledge that, and then by contrast, his uh, topping of anti-intellectualism denies this kind of dependence between these two types of knowledge. And a yet more radical form of anti-intellectualism holds that knowing that is dependent on knowing how. Okay, <coughs> ordinarily I would not like to talk uh, against intellectualism in favor of anti-intellectualism in general, but in this very specific Riley sense I, I nevertheless do. And there are many uh, precedents to this uh, positions of this dichotomy in the history of philosophy. Uh, there is the ancient distinction between a techne and episteme. There is one between practical and theoretical knowledge, discussed widely also in the history and philosophy of philosophy science. One between procedural and declarative knowledge. Uh, Ryle himself appeared to be leaning towards more radical anti-intellectualism. He writes on the right, I want to turn the tables and to prove that knowledge how cannot be defined in terms of knowledge that, and further, that knowledge how is a concept logically prior to the concept of knowledge that. So you, first you have to know how, and then you can state it in, in the propositional form what you know. That will be Rice claim. Elsewhere, Ryle calls the propositional acknowledgement of rule, reason, or principle as not a parent, but as a stepchild of that application. Uh, so I, I think it should be clear that the intellectuals claim that knowing how to do something uh, presupposes knowledge of facts of how to do something, and prior consideration of these facts is rests on a spurious assumption. To see this is enough to consider the picture we saw earlier, what riding a bike entails. So hardly anyone has tried to learn riding a bike by learning it theoretically, as if knowing the facts first before trying to do it in practice. Even uh, in any case, uh, propositional knowledge of how to ride a bike is not required for riding a bike. Um, so, nevertheless, Ryle then says that knowing a rule is knowing how, and it's clear from above that uh, knowing how implies not only knowing the rules of practice either, uh, consciously or perhaps more typically unconsciously, but also that practice itself is regulated or rule-bound. So there are those rules. He writes, when a person knows how to do things of a certain sort, for example, cook omelettes, design dresses or persuade juries, his performance is in some way governed by principles, rules, canons and standards or criteria. And, and this knowledge can then be actualized in one's uh, performances. Uh, now, finally, we are getting closer to the view that I'm trying to express here, what would be knowing how, knowledge how in historiography. Uh, so this is the crucial part. So following Ryle here, my suggestion is that knowing and knowledge in historiography should similarly be considered as the type of knowing how and not knowing that. In other words, when a claim is made, we should not analyze it as a declarative statement that represents a state of affairs or states a complex fact in the external world. I'm not saying that in any languages this would never be possible, but I am saying that as a general strategy this leads to problems and the search for phantom structures of the past. And above all, this representational strategy does not characterize the nature of historiography, in my mind, as fittingly as anti-representational. In my view, research and writing about history is a, a specific type of skills rather than a theoretical model-building task. Uh, it's my claim also that historical knowledge as knowledge how is enough, and it provides us all the necessary epistemic tools to evaluate and judge different pieces of history. Or, in other words, as I would like to talk, uh, different uh, historical performances. The performances here are uh, a key concept. Uh, so, it's evident that this, this 
talk today is just a start and I, an opening for further analysis. And uh, my apologies that I can't provide a fuller account yet and within the time anyway of this uh, today. But I will instead list of a set of conditions that should apply to historiography on this basis. So, with regard to historiography as a practice or a skill of some kind, as rule bound, as a practice or skill, following that uh, correct and incorrect uh, acts are possible, mistakes and wrong moves are possible. So, this is obviously has to be so unless we want to accept absolutely any kind of practice, any kind of uh, outcomes. <coughs> and I think uh, most of us would want to like to avoid the anything goes scenario. Um, of course, there's a quite a bit of a task to specify what these rules and practices then are. So it's daunting task to provide any even near satisfactory account of the kind of practice that historiography is. I focus uh, on it, nevertheless, as a specific type of epistemic activity, which I claim is essential to it, uh, the aim of which, in my mind, is to argue and demonstrate that the certain thesis about the past are justified. Justified. That's the key word, justified. I'm not thinking about truth here, unless truth is redefined. In this sense, historiography is a linguistic and inferential practice, which involves being able to bring other sentences for the defense of one, and being able to infer other sentences from this one, so defending. So at this point, I would like to turn once more, as in uh, my book, Post-Narrativist Philosophy of History of Profit, I'd like to turn to Wilfred Sellers, uh, to his excellent uh, condensed view of what is to make knowledge claims. He writes, the essential point in that is that in characterizing an episode or state as that of knowing, we are not giving an empirical description of that episode or state. We are placing it in the logical space of reasons, of justifying and being able to justify what one says. That's the key thing. So I understand in the sense that if we have even a very mm -hmm. primitive observation, observation of red, color red, color red itself, the observation itself can't function cannot have any role in justifying inference. We can't justify anything. <laughs> but when we enter it in the <coughs> logical space of reasons in this course, we call it red, it already entails all kinds of things, among others, that it's a color, and red is not uh, blue, red is not yellow. And then it can play a role in uh, and a justificatory role in our knowledge <coughs> claims. Uh, in other words, Sellers seem to be saying that there is no non-inference to knowledge. All knowledge is inference. <coughs> in, in tells it commits to something, commits to defense, it enables some inferences and, and, and denies some others. So, this means um, we have Robert Brandom now finally and Ryle again here. Uh, knowledge claims are endorsements of specific claims and as such promises to defend and provide grounds for one's claims. Uh, Roti interprets Sellers' disclaimer above that knowledge is uh, separ separable, separable <coughs> from social practice and specifically from the practice of justifying one's assertions to one's fellow human beings. So in a way, knowledge comes uh, be into being through this uh, practice of justification. So, Brandom is one who has developed the Sellersian view further, and it would be very uh, useful, as I say, to dig deeper in his philosophy. Uh, I'm now content to highlight his idea that knowing is making inferential moves in what he calls the game of giving and asking for reasons. In effect, by making a knowledge claim, one makes what he says, a discursive commitment to vindicate the original claims by showing that one is entitled to make it. And the way to show it, one is entitled, is to bring other entitled inferences, other claims uh, to its defense. And then, if the commitment can be defended, entitled to demonstrate it by justifying the claim, then endorsement of it can have genuine authority. So this idea is that you are in the practical situation, in the social practical situation, you are 
able to defend your claim, you're able to hold your crown. Uh, that's the key for uh, justification. Okay, much more is needed to be said about historiography as practice, its rules and its mistakes. Uh, but I would like to end this talk by two things. First, briefly giving a slightly more specific view of this kind of inferential practice. Skill to defend one's claims and thus in general about how, knowing how, functions in historiography. Let's go back to sleepwalking, and uh, we may now ask, so what is required to justify a claim that Europe went to war like sleepwalkers? Uh, for example, made by Clark himself, which I think he makes, or a student of this book in an exam situation. Let's imagine that. A satisfactory performance defense requires that the claimant is able to defend his claim by making evident of what is claimed and why. In practice, this would, uh, he, would, he or she would need to define such issues as what Europe or perhaps European powers are and why exactly those countries have been chosen, further what is meant by sleepwalking overall and how is this demonstrated in the acts of those state <coughs> powers, their bureaucracies and decision-making structures in the public opinion and media in Europe at the time and again so on and so forth, many other things. He would, uh, she would need to answer. To these questions, I'm out to uh, answers to these questions. I'm out to justifying inferences. Uh, in other words, and uh, it's evident, I think, that it would be possible to continue this kind of uh, asking and giving reasons for a long, perhaps even infinite time. But is this a problem? Isn't this how argumentation and discourse works in historiography? One questions and challenges, and the other provides uh, grounds for defense. And it's notable that this takes place in a social situation, sometimes literally in the same space as today, other times through literal dissemination, such as uh, reviewing reviews and other printed scholarly discussion. And above all, my view is that it's a skill of how to reason, draw inferences, and defend one's claim. So my message today is that this should be, a practice of this kind should be understood as defining what knowing in historiography is. Final slide and final question. When does one know them? And I have tried to come up with this kind of uh, short, concise um, attempt to say, to define it. One is said to know when questioning and answering comes to a point of saturation, when the one who challenges has no more challenges left, or he is content with the defense provided. So one is able to hold one's ground, in other words. In this situation, the historian knows how to defend his view of the past, and that is all that is needed for knowledge. Thank you.